In looking into the history of equations and symbols, we noticed that European algebra in the 1500s was preoccupied with solving equations built around some problem with an unknown quantity, particularly there with cubic equations. When it comes to the broad outlines of setting up and solving for unknowns in problems, this was not at all a new activity. Posing problems and learning and practicing methods to solve them has been central to math in a lot of settings. Many of the very oldest mathematical texts we can find, cuneiform tablets from Mesopotamia around 4,000 years ago, are either texts asking the reader to solve a particular problem, a solution to or scratch work for such an exercise, tables to be used to help to solve math problems, or even seemingly a teacher planning out some such exercises where the answers are supposed to turn out to be round numbers so that the calculation isn't too tedious for the student. Most histories of math describe achievements and progress in terms of what kinds of problems could be posed and solved by new methods or ideas, especially when it comes to algebra. Here are some of the most famous problem texts from different traditions, each before algebra came to Europe. There's the Nine Chapters in China, sometime before 200 CE. There's the Bakshali manuscript in India, sometime before 800 CE. There's Al-Kitab al-Mutasar fi Hisab al-Jabr wal mukabala or the condensed book on the calculation of restoring and comparing in 825 CE by Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi. And as a final example that we can actually spend a moment with today, I'd like to show you a cuneiform tablet, known colorfully as 2N-T30. We'll just call it 2NT30 for short. It was found in the ancient city of Nippur, today in southern Iraq, in 1948, and it was created sometime in the 18th century BCE. Eleanor Robson uses this tablet in the beginning of her book, Mathematics in Ancient Iraq, to set up a number of her themes about the need to examine much more carefully what we think we know about ancient mathematics. And here's her translation of the tablet's contents. This very old text is strikingly similar in content to what's in a textbook today that we might assign to a student learning how to do decimal calculations by hand. Mathematically, it provides the side of a square's length and asks the student to compute the area of that square. It shows a method to follow through on this calculation and the answer. A common way texts like these seem to have been used was to have the teacher write things out on the first side and then for the student to reproduce the content on the back or obverse side, kind of like looking for the answer in the back of the book today. We'll talk more later about how much we borrow from Mesopotamia 4,000 years ago, but we can already see similarities in the practices, materials, and discourse of mathematics education and writing. In the same way that I remember reading something like Homer's Iliad and realizing how many similarities there were between how I felt about my own life and the stories that were described in there, I see that this game of setting and solving problems goes way back and is maybe a bit more wrapped up with everything else than we usually credit. When others say that there's math everywhere, I usually feel like they're just trying to get you to put up with a boring subject long enough to pass a test. It feels cynical and patronizing. But in some other sense, one that has more to do with how humanities puts numbers to use than God being a mathematician, the trappings of math actually have been with us for a very long time and are woven deep in our psyches. The game of asking others to solve pointless math problems is one of humanity's oldest. Before we leave the actual subject of solving though, there's one thing I'd like us to think about. To solve a problem, there has to be some agreement on what kind of solution is needed or acceptable. And very often in textbooks, some sort of agreement on what methods are acceptable. What counts as an answer and how it is arrived at, of course, matters when it comes to passing math tests. But this also goes deeper. Throughout history, major mathematical advancements have occurred when these assumptions are questioned. And even dividing math from the rest of thought can be described as happening when you enter this world of solving problems using just what's in the book. We almost don't even notice anymore that the problems in our math textbooks, like this one, give away their unreality with the very round numbers that come up in them. But let's look at what our problem, solve 3x minus 7 equals 15, is really asking. The first step for this problem would be to move 7 to the other side. You're adding 7 to both sides. You end up with 3x equals 22. The next step would be to divide both sides by 3. The 3's cancel, and we end up with x equals 22 over 3. You can be done with your answer here, or maybe your teacher doesn't like improper fractions. Usually this is when you're younger, and so you would need to figure out this is 7 and a third. As you keep going in math and you get more used to using a calculator, maybe you switch over to the decimal system, and you want to write 7.3333. 
three, 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 you know, you go on as far as your calculator goes. If you get into college math, your instructor all of a sudden might have a problem with this and ask you to write something like that there. We'll get into that later, but this is not exactly the same as that number there. You can, of course, get by this by adding three little dots, and then you don't need to use those wavy lines that mean approximate because this is that actual number. Again, we'll get into that later. Just going through what it means to solve the problem that we've been staring at for the last hour or so and think about what sort of a social contract that verb solve is entering us into. This kind of problem is given to a student at a particular time, a particular place in their learning. It's constructed and posed in order to give them some practice with the basic rules of manipulating equations and understanding this goal of getting x alone by itself. Along the way, you have to do a little bit with fractions, but not so much complicated arithmetic that it gets in the way of practicing the structural rules of algebra. The Babylonian problem 2MT30 is a different kind. There, the relationship between the square and its side would already be known by the learner. And what they're being asked to do is to carry out the complicated arithmetic of actually doing the squaring. This exercise was designed to practice the use of the sexagesimal number system. The numerical system that allows either the final step in our problem or the 2MT30 problem to work can often be an important part of what it means to solve. I've chosen numbers in my example that are simple enough, but you may wonder the extent to which our familiar decimals and calculators allow us to easily deal with things like 1 seventh plus 4 elevenths, or something even just wild that might come up in an algebra class like that. Even just writing down that number makes heavy use of all the advances that went into decimal from the hundreds of years between uh, Arabic adoption, say like 900, to the time we get to, well, past Simon Stephen in 1600, let's say. These kinds of numbers don't actually get very easy to deal with into logarithms. But again, that's a story for another day. Numbers that they tend to come up in real life they tend to be rougher, and when we do division, we often result in worse decimals than this slightly troubling 0.3 repeating, that even though they're usually in the background, they end up being pretty important to being able to actually do any of this arithmetic work and connect it to any real context. So just as an intended kind of number can guide us when we're trying to solve something, we often find ourselves limited to using the tools that the book wants us to use in this particular section, let's say. We're not allowed to get out a protractor to measure the angle to see if it's a right angle. We're not allowed to pull out any particular fact that we remember, but instead we have to choose among the axioms we're given. The things that at this point, for this moment, at this day, the things that we're allowed to know already. In word problems, we never have the luxury of simply asking Susie how many apples she has. We have to set up an equation. Constructing a specially contained environment can feel odd at times, fake even. But in the worlds of sports or games, it actually fits right in. Golf is not about getting a ball in a hole. It only becomes a game when you require the player to get the ball there by hitting it with a club in a minimum number of strokes. Every game is defined not just by what is supposed to happen, but also how. Math's no different. The textbook scaffolds and walls in our practice, only giving us questions to answer that make sense in that one section, or after we've already taken trig, maybe even with the convenience that odd-numbered problems have the answers in the back. Within a textbook, the word solve does not mean the same thing as in everyday life. It's much more like finishing a puzzle, completing a crossword, or winning in some board game than real life. Each problem is completely cut off from the real world and any other sense of context. There's no external meaning or consequence of actually finding X. What this means for us, the doers of the problems, can sometimes be liberating. Doing math can feel like a chance to leave the mess of the real world behind even if only for a little while. Or at other times, it can feel inauthentic. The find x meme works on this basis. We know that the student's location of x on the page is not what the teacher wants. And yet, they've clearly found x. We laugh because we know that we have been taught to jump through those hoops, but maybe not why. Knowing that this separation exists between math and real life can help us find our place if we pay attention. Seeing the different possible meanings of the word solve and the games in which this verb takes part makes it obvious how there can be difficulties when trying to address real problems via the kind of solving that you do in math class. It helps us to solve math problems because we know not to try to rely too much on the real world or its context along the way. 
We don't need to worry about the mental states or histories of the people in the word problems that we read. We just find a way to turn the stuff into equations and get on with our lives. One more lesson that we could learn from noticing that solving math problems is set up like a game is to think about the difference between knowing the rules and being able to develop strategies within the game. Regardless of the game, if the game is any good, it's because the quality of play does not simply follow in a straight line from the rules. There are ways to see through the rules and play at a higher level. Boring games like tic-tac-toe and war do not permit creativity, but every game worth playing does. Algebra enables creative play, but people usually miss this. Because the usual goal is to measure how well a student is able to follow directions and repeat instructions. It's not about their ability to creatively play with the math that we give them. See, the plan for each unit in a class is to show people how to use a specific problem solving or computational method, how to make a particular move. Then we assign problems that require this method and little else so as to give as much attention to the current subject as we can. People very rarely get to see chances to make use of standard moves in unstandard ways where they need to make creative use of what they know to be able to solve a problem. The problem we're working from up here does not emit any creativity. I mean, you can play around with it if you want, but it's kind of a dead fish. But next time, we'll choose a problem that, that does emit a little bit of creativity. And in future episodes, we'll look at some moves that are really hard to anticipate ahead of time and that hopefully from the point of view of this being a game, we might be able to appreciate the sportsmanship of. In our next section, I wanna talk about the names that we give to variables and how that ends up a little bit differently than what we might otherwise imagine and how people choose to name things ends up saying something about the thing that they're trying to name and also the people who are doing the naming. Until then, this has been Anatomy of Algebra.